This is a video prepared jointly with my friends Alan Cottrell and David Zachariah defending our ideas against the criticisms of Andrew Kleeman. Why are we bothering to do this? It's because it's become clear from messages we've received that quite a lot of people have doubts on the truth of the data presented by empirical Marxists like us because of the criticisms that Kleeman has been levelling at them. And at stake is whether the labour theory of value actually holds as an empirically observable scientific law or whether Marxists should proceed by what Mark, what Kleeman calls the method of textual analysis which basically means poring over Marx to try and determine what's true from the interpretation of his books. We will explain why the competing claims of the Kleeman School and the empirical Marxists clash, and in particular how they clash with regard to the laws governing prices and profits. We will argue that the question has to be answered empirically, that if the labour theory of value is true, then the price of output of an industry will be largely determined by the direct and indirect labour required to produce it. We will then go on to show what Kleeman's criticisms of that claim are and the weakness of Kleeman's criticisms. And in a further video, we will look at Kleeman's own theories. Now we're going to run through why we think the labour theory of value is an empirically strong theory presenting a sample of the evidence for it. The key evidence has three pieces. One is that there is a strong correlation between the money value obtained by the sale of an industry's output and the labour content required to make that industry's output directly and indirectly. Secondly, other inputs like oil, electricity, etc. don't show strong correlations with the final value of output. And thirdly, and this is particularly important, rates of profit are systematically lower in capital intensive industries. On the strong correlations, lots of different economists have, have produced data on this. Um, here's a, a, a sample of a few of them. David Zachariah has shown that for Japan and Sweden, the correlations between labour content and the money value of output of industries are 98 to 96%. Alan Cottrell and I have shown for the USA and UK that you get figures of 97 and 95%. Sul Fidis and Maniatis have shown for Greece uh, a figure of 94%. And there are lots of other ones, um, lots of other studies by people like Anwar Sheikh, Petrovic, Froelich, etc., which substantially give the same results. Uh, as we give, as we summarise there. The next point is that other ways of computing value, for instance, if you suppose that the real substance of value was energy, not labour, or the real substance of value was fuel, not labour, you get much lower correlations. You get positive correlations, but they're much weaker. So there is something special about labour. I've given a, a, a sample of the correlations that uh, David found for Sweden, but we have published similar results for the UK. And the next point is that the rate of profit is systematically lower in highly capital-intensive industries. The x-axis here 
shows the capital to wage ratio, that is to say how capital intensive an industry is. The vertical axis shows the rate of profit and the crosses indicate actual observations of actual industries. Now, if we work on the theory of value that Marx presents in version one of Capital, we would expect an inverse relationship between capital intensity and profitability, as shown by this line here, which is the line of constant rate of surplus value. If, on the other hand, an equalization of profit rates was occurring, we would expect the data to fall along this horizontal line. Now, it's clear from just a glance at it that doesn't fall along the horizontal line. It falls much closer to the line of this slope here, which is the observations you would get if volume one of capital was right, and you just, just disregarded volume three of capital and the entire literature on the transformation problem. Now that is data that Zachariah obtained for Sweden. This is data that Alan and I gave for the United States. And again, you see the same inverse relationship exists, that the rate of profit is systematically lower in industries with an organic composition of capital that is high. It's very hard to see how this process, this observation, could be compatible with anything other than a labor theory of value. So, how does the law of value work? What causes it? It's what we call an emergent law. The term emergent law didn't exist, say, 50 years ago, but it's become a common thought for, or idea for dealing with complex systems. What we have to say is how do the material conditions of social production, which are there's a set of direct and indirect labour requirements and there's some supply and demand constraints, how do these hit the final price? How do they make it happen? Suppose you had a firm which produced things entirely out of labour, which had no non-labour inputs then the only way in which the direct labour requirements, the socially necessary labour time, could impinge on the final price was via the transmission of information about labour used through wage costs. If you have a firm which produces things which use inputs in addition to labour, then the input costs, which are prices of other firms, impinge on the final price. They're the means by which the direct and indirect labour requirements for production get transmitted informationally to influence the final price. They can't influence it except through some information about wage costs and input costs being operative. So the effect of labour value on price is mediated by the integrated cost structure of a market economy. Kleeman's objection to the results of empirical Marxism are partly that he's put forward this theory which he claims to have arrived at by a close textual analysis of Marx. But the main important points, he says, is that there's no valid evidence that the money value of industry's outputs are correlated with labour values. And he thinks that the classical labour theory of value, as understood by previous economists, is invalid. Now, why is this important? Well, I think Kleeman is actually following the mistake that Ricardo made, and which, unfortunately, in Volume 3, Marx copied, in assuming that the rate of profit can be taken as equal across capitals. Now, we know that that isn't the case in practice. 
He then puts a huge effort into trying to come up with a consistent solution to the transformation problem, a consistent set of prices which are consistent with an equalised rate of profit. Whether he succeeds or not is something we'll deal with in another video. But the problem is that there's no actual evidence for profit rate equalisation. The whole driving motivation of his theory is based on something which doesn't exist. Since actual profit rates decrease with rising organic composition of capital, they're not constant. And only the labour theory of value from volume one and two is of capital is consistent with the observation that capital intensive industries earn low rates of profit. No profit equalisation type theory can explain this empirical observation. That applies to Serafa's theory, it applies to Kleeman's theory, it applies to Steedman's theory. All of these have the same weakness, that they're basically counterfactual. Now, in order to defend this theory, Kleeman claims that the correlations between price and value that other Marxist economists have reported are spurious side effects of the sizes of industries. He says that big industries have large outputs, both in labour value and money value senses. And that in order to deal with this, you have to adjust or control for industry size. Otherwise, we're being misled by just giving high money values for big industries and high labour values for big industries. But the question is, how do we measure size? You could do it lots of different ways. You could say, how much land does an industry use? So agriculture would come out top. How much employment does an industry use? Well, if you're talking about employment, then you're using basically the labour theory of value. Lab industry is big if it uses a lot of labour. Alternatively, you could say in, an industry is big if it uses a lot of energy. Or an uh, industry is big if it has a large tonnage of output. Or that it costs a lot to make its output. So a, this idea of size is ambiguous. For instance, which is bigger? The um, Taiwanese silicon chip industry? or the Italian Carrera marble industry. Now, in terms of mass, the marble industry is way ahead. It ships out far more mass of marble than is shipped out in the form of silicon from the, the silicon chip industry. But if you talked about it in money terms or labor terms, well, then the, the, the relationship is reversed. Now, I've already said that one of the strong empirical evidences for the labour theory of value are that if you take a non-labour input as the value base, like agricultural outputs or chemicals in the Swedish case, you get a very poor correlation. It's only when you use labour you get a strong correlation between content of in terms of X, whether X is agriculture, chemical, labour, content of X and money value. Now, if size itself was an independent variable that was causing everything, it would cause that effect whether you used agriculture, chemicals or labour. So, that observation tends to undermine his idea that the correlation is spurious. That Here's a graphical presentation of it. Now, this line here is the relationship between labour input here and money value of British industries. And these clusters here show the equivalent relationships between iron input and money output, between electricity input and money output, and between computer input and money output. And the only one which does any has any reasonable performance there is the computer industry. And I would speculate that the reason the computer industry does so well is it's actually approximate, a proxy for the labour input. In general, you have one person sitting in front of each computer. Um, but the other things don't perform well at all. And if size was the cause, run something special about 
labour. All of these industries would correlate well whatever input you used, whether you used electricity, steel or computers. Now, Kleeman doesn't want to use employment as a measure of size. He uses costs. Now, the classic and classical Marxian labour theory of value predicts if an industry output requires lots of direct and indirect labour time, they'll also have a high money value. Kleeman says we evaluate this effect of labour value by controlling for size in terms of their cost. Now, does this make sense? At first sense, the site, no, it's nonsense. But let's see how he justifies it. He justifies it by talking about spurious correlations. If, for example, you want to study the role of excess drinking on crime, crimes of violence, it would be no good just tabulating all the cities in Britain and seeing how much beer was drunk in each city and how much street violence there was in each city because the strongest effect there is going to be population size. London is going to have more beer drunk, more street violence than Inverness is. So it's no good just looking at that unless you com compensate for, for, for population size. And population size is there a confounding variable. But you mustn't confuse confounding variables with mediating variables. Suppose you're wanting to study gender differences in pay or sex differences in pay. Having children is the mediating variable which causes women's pay to be less than male pay. If you controlled for mediating variables here, that is to say, you only compared childless women with childless men, you would remove the real effect which causes women's pay to be lower. So, as if you plot from the start of, or from, from the, the date of having the first child, you see that before that, ma male and female earnings, or female earnings without kids, track perfectly. First child is born, the income of a woman with children falls, whereas the, the woman without children continues to rise. If you only tracked women without kids and compared them with male earnings, then you would miss out the big factor which causes it, which causes the average female income to be lower. So controlling for a mediating variable removes the effect and leads to an invalid influence about social processes. And the point is that here, in Kleeman's case, input costs and wage costs are the mediating variables by which direct and indirect labour requirements influence the final price. If you control for mediating variables, you block the causal pathway, just as if you had decided to exclude all women who had children from your sample. You would block the causal pathway. So, Kleeman's attempt to control for the effect of costs removes the effect and leads to invalid causal influences. But it's worth looking at slightly more detail at the maths of how he does this. This is taken from Kleeman's book, page 198. In this, W is his notation for value. It's important to note that he, d he computes values rather differently from Marxian economists. Um, but he, he, he treats just monetary costs as being of a, a fact. He treats the monetary costs that a firm faces as being directly equivalent to 
the, the C plus V. He doesn't think that you have to make any adjustment to the C plus V for that. But let's leave that to one side. W is the value of output, P is the price of output, S is the surplus value, and P is the actual realized profits. So he says that these relations have to hold by definition. So we'll ignore his incorrect uh, formula and just assume that we'll work with his formula. And he says we must eliminate the possibility of spurious correlation because both of these things contain the variable k. And it's the k which is causing the spurious correlation. And he says if a strong correlation after, remains after this, we will have discovered a very important fact that the amount of surplus value an industry produces is the de dominant determinant of the amount of profit it produces. Well, that's a fair point. But how do you control for K? Well, it's an additive element. You've got K plus S. How do you cancel out something which is added? You subtract it. So if you want to obtain S and you know what W is, you subtract K. Sorry, if you if you want, you know what W is and you know what K is and you want to find S, you subtract K from it. And similarly, you subtract K from P and you'll get pi, the profits. Then, that is, we can then see whether the surplus value correlates with profit. Now, in the second equation, you're just taking actual observations and looking at actual profits. For surplus value, you can't do it that way. You have to look at the wages paid in each industry and you look at the mean rate of surplus value across the whole economy and you say what would be the expected surplus value if say the exploitation rate was 100 percent the wage bill is 10 million well you'd expect the surplus value to be 10 million if we do that for the British economy 1998, which I did for the purpose of this slide, you find that the actual profit along this axis and the imputed surplus value, calculated the way I mentioned, actually correlate very well. They don't correlate perfectly, 71%. Still a pretty good correlation. Now, Kleeman claims that if you relate these, they don't correlate. Well, he's wrong. And he's wrong because he his method of compensating for costs or cancelling out the K term is wrong. This is what Kleeman claims happens. He claims you get a graph like this at the beginning. Well, that's fair enough. That's a, the sort of graph you get for the relationship between labour values and prices. And then he translates it into that when he compensates. Well, that's not what we empirically observe and the difference is that he is dividing by k rather than subtracting k and that makes no sense division only makes sense if we don't assume that it's an an additive relationship between k and s but instead that you have a multiplicative relation but what the, the, a multiplicative relation in which you're multiplying k by 1 plus some ratio. It's not clear what this ratio could be. There's certainly nothing in Marx's labour theory of value that says the surplus value is obtained by multiplying the total c plus v by some 1 plus some ratio. Now, it's a bit like what you do when you're computing prices of production. But we're not computing prices of production here. We're trying to deal with surplus value. If you divide the equation W equals K plus S by K, what you get is W over K equals 1 plus S over K. And if you do it for price, you get P over K equals 1 plus Pi over K. And Kleeman claims that the real price value correlation 
should persist after dividing by k. But there's no particular reason to suppose from Marx that that should correlate with that. As I say, the division makes some kind of sense if you're looking at pi over k, which is the rate of profit, but it doesn't make any sense for surplus value. Since according to Marx, the surplus value, s, is formed by multiplying the rate of surplus value times the, ver the variable capital. You don't get s by multiplying the rate of surplus value times the total costs, or k is c plus v. So he's not actually using a method of compensation that corresponds to the actual equation he uses for value. He's assuming a different sort of equation when he divides, and he gets a nonsense result. He, he sets up a straw man that there should be the same correlation between flow profit rates and surplus value per unit of costs. There's nothing in Marxism which says that ought to be true. But his conclusions rest on a more fundamental mistake, which Alan Cottrell will explain to you. We now come to another elementary mistake that Kleeman makes in his statistics. Having brought up this red herring of deflating by costs, he claims that if the correlation between labour values and prices were real, it would survive deflation by cost because he says that if you subtract the logarithm of a variable which will say k for costs here from the logarithm of prices and subtract it from the logarithm of wages sorry d not wages values you will get a cluster which should have the same correlation and the same slope as the original slope so if you had this slope here between prices and wages he says that if you subtract uh, k, which is correlated to it, you will retain the correlation. And he does that for published data, or sorry, or data he's ca calculated for prices and labour values and finds that the correlation gets destroyed and the, the graph is destroyed. Well, it is a false claim that if you subtract k from p, or log k from log p rather, and if log k is correlated with log p, that you will retain the original correlation and retain the original slope. We're demonstrating this using some synthetic data, not real price and labour data, but we, we've got A and B, uh, um, sorry, we've got value and price synthetically simulated. They're not taken from real data, but they have the degree of correlation, 96%, 97% correlation, that you actually see in real data. And then we've got a K, which is correlated to the degree that... Um, Kleeman requires, or Kleeman states, for costs, and we're subtracting that from it. And this is purely simulated data, not real data. And what happens? Well, um, he, this is the line that you originally have. You subtract the, the, K, the, the log k from it, and you get a cluster here, which is no longer correlated. Now, Kleeman says this proves the original data wasn't correlated. Well, what we're showing is that if you arbitrarily take away a K, which is correlated with both P and W, you do, in fact, destroy the correlation of the original data. And you don't get the same slope as you should do. 
Kleeman claims that if we um, take k from each, he thinks that the logarithm of p minus the logarithm of k will be given by the original slope of the logarithm of w minus the logarithm of k minus an error. And when he observes in empirical data that this isn't the case, he concludes that no, 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 prices aren't actually correlated with labour values. Well, if you just do it with completely random, non-real data, you destroy the correlation. And this is to be expected. Why? Because of the, the formula for what the slope of this new line should be. It's actually given by a complex formula, the log of, it's the covariance of the log of p over k minus the log of w over k divided by the variance of the log of w over k. And in general, that will not be the same. So Clemens claimed that by choosing something highly correlated, the costs of an industry, and dividing through by that, that the correlation between value and price should s survive that is totally false. It's based on incorrect maths of what you expect to get the slope of a new line to be when you subtract another random variable from it. And this is just a desperate attempt by Kleeman to save his theory against the Marxian labour theory of value, to save his cost-price theory against the Marxian labour theory of value. In conclusion, we can say that the labour theory of value is strongly backed by empirical evidence. Kleeman's alternative price theory cannot account for low profit rates in capital intensive sectors. His idea for controlling for costs blocks precisely the causal pathways through which the law of value emerges and leads to invalid inferences. The implications of controlling for costs, as we've shown in the last section, directly counter Kleeman's own conclusions.